Well, good morning, Ian, and uh, good morning, Malcolm. Um, good morning. It's lovely to have brought morning. both of you together. <laughs> I'm grateful <laughs> to you for doing so. Mm -hmm. I've only had a number of <laughs> mental <laughs> conversations with Ian, so it's nice to have an actual one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I, I've lived with Malcolm uh, while I was reading Coleridge the Mariner, but um, yes, and I'm an admirer of his poems too, so <laughs> well, <laughs> it's yeah. lov lovely to meet at last. Yes, mm. indeed. Indeed, indeed. Well, having, uh, I mean, I had one conversation previously with, with Ian and uh, and uh, many with Malcolm, I, I kind of realised there were quite a lot of overlapping interests. Um, but what really sort of sparked the idea of having this conversation was was hearing Malcolm um, talking about a, a very early, I think, poem of, of C.S. Lewis, which I'd never come across before, but seemed to just have so many sort of McIlchrist themes of all the left. <laughs> 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 that it yeah. just seemed to be a very nice way to, into the conversation. So, I don't know. Perhaps Malcolm, you could you could start us off by just telling us about the poem and and and. Right. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm very happy. So the poem was not published in Lewis's lifetime, um, surprisingly, because it's a very good poem. But he was disheartened by poor reviews and very poor sales of his his only two purely poetry books in his lifetime. So he kind of wrote rather more secretly after that. Um, and the poem was published posthumously in an edition put together quite hastily by Walter Hooper. Uh, and he, he, Walter Hooper, it turns out, titled the poem Reason. The more I read the poem, and the poem is about the, the balance or the imbalance. It's about the, the dilemma Lewis feels in mediating between his two capacities of imagination and reason. And it's a poem he's seeking for a reconciler. I thought it couldn't be called reason. because He wouldn't have called it reason because it would immediately upset the balance the very question he's asking to title it either reason or imagination in fact if i were to give it a title i would call it who but there it was printed in print it said reason but i became so convinced that he couldn't have called it this that i actually managed to get in touch with walter hooper and ask him what had been in the autograph manuscript and he said no there hadn't been a title but he felt the need to assign it and because reason was written in capital letters he thought well i'll, I'll call it reason um, in the new scholarly edition by Don King, it's it's without title, um, you know, because of the arguments I put forth. So, Ian, I think you already knew or know of the the, the wonderful passage in um, Surprised by Joy, which is, of course, a much later book, when Lewis looks back to his time in the 1920s, really, as a young Don in Cambridge before his conversion. And you may remember he famously says, the two hemispheres of my mind, a phrase for you, the two hemispheres of my mind were in the sharpest contrast. On the one side, a many islanded sea of myth and poetry. On the other, a glib and shallow rationalism. Nearly everything I loved, I believed to be imaginary. Nearly everything I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. And of course, you know, biographers of Lewis and historians of the time might reasonably object that that book was written many years after the state of mind he describes and after his conversion. And so you might want to have an earlier record penned in those years about how he felt. And I have become persuaded that this poem is exactly that. Um, just because it seemed to be so much on the cusp of an answer to the question or a conversion, I was thinking it might be in the late 1920s, maybe 28 or 29. Um, Alistair McGrath actually thinks it might be earlier still. In which case, if it was 26 or so, then he was living with the question he asks in this poem for about five years before he attained some kind of answer and reconciliation. So I'll read you the poem. It's a glorious extended metaphor. Um, it's a sort of extended sonnet to 16 liner in which Lewis imagines his soul as though it were the ancient city or anybody's soul uh, as though it were the ancient city of Athens. And he thinks about the two kinds of Greek religion, as it were. He thinks about the pure and beautiful exactitudes and the kind of geometric perfections of the Parthenon on the one hand. And then he thinks, I think he thinks about the fertility rites and the mysteries down in the caves. And he uses these two as metaphors for the faculties of reason. Mm. So here's the poem without further ado. It's uh, I think one of his very best. Set on the soul's acropolis, the reason stands, a virgin armed, commercing with celestial light. 
And he who sins against her has defiled his own virginity. No cleansing makes his garment white. So clear is reason. But how dark imagining. Warm, dark, obscure and infinite. Daughter of night. Dark is her brow. The beauty of her eyes with sleep is loaded. And her pains are long. And her delight. Tempt not Athene. Wound not in her fertile pains, Demeter, nor rebel against her mother right. Oh, who will reconcile in me both maid and mother, who make in me a concord of the depth and height, who make imagination's dim exploring touch ever report the same as intellectual sight? Then could I truly say and not deceive, then wholly say that I believe. Mm. So I'd be really interested to know what, what, what you think of that poem, Ian, and, or any you know, comments, <laughs> first responses to it. Yes. Well, as to the remarks about hemispheres, of course, a, a chill enters into my blood whenever I hear somebody from... Um, uh, fairly, fairly remote time talking about hemispheres because I, in in order to say what I wanted to say about them, I had to sort of jettison most of the baggage that they carried with them. Yeah. On the other hand, I think that there is a long history of people seeing that there are two fundamental ways in which we seem to approach the world, and these have been sometimes cast as famously Nietzsche cast them as the Apollonian and the Dionysian, yes, yes. which is really more or less what we're we're hearing there. Although I like the Demeter rather than Dionysius, actually. Yeah, in um, fact, I like the fact that they're both both goddesses. Yes, I, I do say, too. Say to people who, who have a rather parody version of Lewis as some curmudgeonly old, repressed, probably, you know, misogynist Don who couldn't understand women. And I say, well, look, here's somebody <laughs> saying... He's taking the two <laughs> greatest powers of his inner life and figuring yes. them both in, as goddesses. I mean, I, I summed up this poem to a young student once as saying, basically, here's a guy saying, I can't get my inner goddesses together. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, wait, I, wait, I, I'm glad you like Demeter. I th I, I'm aware of the Apollonian and Dionysian distinction. Of yes, that, yes, uh, so yes. It's a good way of thinking about poetry. But um, yes. I think the the, but, the Athene hmm. Demeter adds nuance. Yes, well, it, it does, and also what's good is that um, uh, Dionysus is mainly famous for, or Dionysus is ma mainly famous for um, being drunk, <laughs> whereas Demeter is mainly known for um, being that fertile um, seed bed in which things grow, as it were. The, so. Um, I, 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 altogether, I'm, I'm, I, I like that. And one of the things I've discovered in writing, particularly The Matter With Things, the book that came out last year, is how much um, people in all cultures have sensed that there are two powers, if you like, inside them, or two modes of being, which are at conflict uh, with one another, or can be, and and you find this in 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 China, you find it in Japan, you find it in India, you find it in the North American native people's legends. In fact, there's one particularly staggering one there from the Onondaga people, who long before anyone knew anything at all about the differences between the the hemispheres, describes very very well. Um, better than anybody that I know, you know, in the pre-scientific era, the differences between the hemispheres. And I spent half a dozen pages unpacking that. So I think that this intuition people have, an inward sense that their mind is not single, but has these um, at least two principal modes of operation that need to cooperate. Both are necessary, but one is more important than the other. Yes, it's the both are necessary thing, I think, is, is, is really important. You know, Lewis is not mm. playing here for a triumph of one over the other, but no, for a reconciliation. No. Uh, and I, I, I love the way in this, although he uses the two images of, you know, the virgin goddess and the mother goddess, and he then maps it onto the senses as well. So you have intellectual sight and you have magic, yes. dim exploring touch. And then you have the dimensional thing as well. You have the imagination as kind of, you know, below somehow 
how uh, kind of wooming fertile dark and you have the yes. the reason above with the sort of clarity of the night sky uh, yes um, yes so, so yes. he's got a whole series of contrasting things but all of which are mutual you know in some way yes i mean i think there's a well, reason there's a, there's a distinctively Christian element to this, even though Lewis is not a Christian at that point, because the language of the depth and height, the language of reconciliation, even the language of reconciling maid and mother, all point to a lot of things that could be said about the idea of incarnation and the the transcendent becoming the imminent and, and even Mary as both maid and mother. So I think there are distinctive things there. But I think mm. the general, the general uh, contrasts, but the need for reconciliation are really good. What troubles me sometimes? The, no, go, go on. No, no. The even the idea that reason and imagination are necessarily at loggerheads is is a, a, a mistake in in my view, yeah. because I would make a distinction between the purely rationalizing faculty um, that, in effect, a computer could carry out. And what is meant by a much bigger and broader and deeper idea, that of reason, which is a bringing together yeah. of one's ability to think in, in rational terms with all that one learns from experience and that comes from one's emotional, mm. embodied and spiritual life. Yes, I think that's a very helpful distinction because reason is sometimes used as though it meant mere ratiocination or following a logical yes. procedure. Yes. Whereas yes. certainly in the sort of in the kind of texts that I read, you know, when I was doing my doctorate on the sermons of John Donne and Lancelot Andrews, for example, so you're looking oh, wow. at very thoughtful prose from the late mm. and early 17th century, they used reason with a capital R <laughs> in a far more inclusive way than we would. And yeah. they obviously clearly intend to in include reflection on experience and some of what we would call intuition, a kind of so I yes, think that there's a, I mean, to, to just uh, to be develop Lewis, just one last point on him. Obviously, he thought about these things for a very long time. And I think he put one of the things that came to him after the dilemma, in a sense, the dilemma expressed in this was partly resolved by his coming to faith. But much later in a, in a purely literary critical es essay about um, understanding literature, a very oddly titled mm. essay blue spells and flallon spheres, two completely made up words of Lewis's. He has this to say, he says, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. And uh, that's, uh, yes, that's I, I like that. Partly because in, in, in this, the, the matter with things falls into three parts. The first part is neuroscience establishing the differences between the hemispheres. The second part is epistemology. And in that, I, I reckon that probably there are four main paths that people would consider might lead them to truths, but they're quite, um, they, they sound rather different from one another, science, reason, intuition, and imagination. And what I suggest is that imagination is on a different level from the other three, and that actually each of the other three depends well they all depend on one another in fact um and that the best way to approach anything is to use as many of these as one can ah. but that all all three of science reason and intuition depend enormously on imagination imagination is not really on the same level as them but something so deep and so important that ah. it alone brings us insight and understanding including in science and including in hmm. reason yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I'm so glad to hear that. I, I really agree with that. Um, first of all, I think we just, Coleridge famously said, it's the philosopher's privilege to distinguish, but not to divide. And so I think when we distinguish these things, we're not saying they're not mutually interwoven. But I completely agree that imagination underlies a great deal of science and other supposedly non-imaginative things. Tom McLeish is somebody uh, who's been writing about yes. Yeah. I think yes. Incredibly... I love the um, the phrase in in Lewis of the, the the dim imagination's dim exploring touch, which I think just captures mm. very nicely mm. the way that actually imagination kind of reaches um, into things mm. that you can't get any in any other way. And um, I, th I mean, Malcolm, you talk rather in that... there's a, mm. there's that lovely um, passage at the end of um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, mm. Where Theseus is talking about imagination, and yeah. it's it's a um, 
it's such a, a delightful quest, partly because he, he talks about these, um, uh, I mean, he these sort of legend, the legendary sort of um, yeah. creatures talking about things, whereas he himself is. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that's, I mean, obviously, it's a very, it's an early play of Shakespeare's. It's a delightfully playful play. Um, and of course, it's a comedy, uh, and it's therefore about uh, it has to end with marriages. And he kind of maps out some of these very pairings that we're thinking about that might be described in polar terms as almost opposites, but are actually, uh, there must be some current of meaning flowing mutually between them as there are between the poles of a magnet. And um, so you have, on the one hand, Oberon and Titania quarreling. And you have Theseus and Hippolyta who have been at war and their marriage is now to be a peace. Uh, she is the Amazon queen. And to some degree, Theseus tries to set himself up as the plain, I mean, he's, he happens to be a mythical Duke of Athens, but he, he sets himself up in the play as a plain, blunt-speaking, rather pragmatic Englishman. And, uh, and yet Shakespeare puts into his mouth, into the mouth of a hostile witness, as it were, deliberately puts into his mouth the best account, I think we have, of the poetic imagination. So you meant that's a wonderful scene. It's the beginning of Act Five. And of course, all the lovely plays and interplays and combinations and recombinations of all the possible ones that work through of who's in love with whom out in the magic of the woods. But when they come back to the daylight court, as it were, of nice rational Athens, the lovers, through their midnight exploits with Puck and all the rest, have now been rightly sorted. They're ha ready to be happily married. But Theseus and Hippolyta don't see that. They're off stage during all that time. So Act Five comes on this wonderful thing where they've obviously been told off stage what all these adventures were. And we, the audience, you know, within the play, we know it happened, but they have to take it on trust. And, um, you know, it, Hippolyta says, oh, it is strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. And Theseus starts off with this, oh, oh, I don't believe this kind of thing. He says, he says, more strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables nor these fairy toys. You know, the lunatic, the lover and the poet are of imagination all compact, you know. And he goes, he, he dismisses the lunatic and the lover in a couple of lines, you know. The, lunatic, the, the madman sees more devils than vast hell can hold, you know. The lover all as frantic sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt, which actually in terms of the play is that like, you really want to say you're in a hole, Theseus, stop digging. If you're with your fiancé <laughs> on the night before a wedding and you say, oh, well, people fall in love with this, or, you know, that, you know, girl's probably ugly, it's just a brief fit there. You know, you don't go there, Theseus. But anyway, then when he comes on to the poet, it suddenly expands. Um, and he's talking about these lovers and madmen have such shaping fantasies that apprehend more cool, more than cool reason ever comprehends. Very interesting. That's the first apprehend, comprehend. Then comes the description of the poet. Uh, that famously, the poet's eye in fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Now, I... I I think that's just a glorious description of, of the imaginative mm. art. I love the fact mm. that you get this from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. I mean, in a sense, one sense, greedily saying earth and heaven means everything. But since he's already said, apprehends more than cool reason ever comprehends, and immediately mm. afterwards he's going to say, if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. I can't help feeling that heaven and earth also are invisible, visible, apprehend, comprehend, that there's, I mean, T.S. Eliot famously said that poetry is peripheral vision, that it's about the thing that is just in the offing that you can't quite see. Yeah. And of course, yeah. if you can turn and focus on it, it disappears. But Eliot thought the poet could, could stay sufficiently still as to woo the peripheral into the, into yes. the um, and, and give it voice. So, so well, as I understand this, <laughs> having, having done heaven, earth, earth, heaven, what Shakespeare says is the imagination which apprehends, then creates a body, a, a, a kind of imagined but visible thing, bodies forth, imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown. So something which is not yet accessible to the reason or to, to yeah, comprehension yeah. is given a model or a shape or a suggestion 
which becomes, as he calls it, a habitation. Now, a habitation is not a kind of thick square thing that you can't get into. Obviously, it has doors and windows. And you go into a habitation to visit somebody. And lots of people have the experience with really great works of art, pieces of music, paintings or, or, or poems or plays, for that matter. That, as it were, it's a finite thing. You know how many lines there are in the play and you know the scene. You know, it, you go, you walk into the same thing every time. But it's like going into a house and finding there are new guests or people you didn't know come out from one of the back rooms. You meet inside the habitation of the work of art all kinds of things which now you can get to know a little bit better. Truths, in fact, that you can get to know a bit better because they've been sort of wooed into some kind of imaged and knowable being. And they're... They're, 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 the meaning yeah. is brought forth. So, I mean, that's uh, interestingly, yes. Thesis is <laughs> logical, has a slight logical slip there because he says it embodies forth the form of things unknown. And later he uses the term airy nothing as if it were the same as unknown, gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. But of course, just because something is unknown doesn't mean it's airy nothing. And in fact, no. I think it's precisely the imaginative art, whether it's somebody suddenly coming up with a complete new model of the cosmos and reconfiguring the observations to see if they fit or Shakespeare creating a character. There's mm. a, there's a, there's a, what's there. It, it was previously unknown, but is now knowable. Yes. The, the value of being unknowable in the sense of fully known or directly known is terrifically important. And I, I started out my, migration from being a student of philosophy and literature to being a doctor <laughs> it, 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 w w with some reflections in an early book against criticism on why things need to remain implicit that when they're dragged into the focus of our attention they're right. decontextualized disembodied and they change their nature completely yeah. so this this idea um that um that Roger was putting forward of, um, I think he was quoting from Lewis, this, what did you call it, this dim uh, yes, grasping? Yes, I the um, imagination's dim exploring touch. Yes, yes uh, th that struck me, a number of things that w were said struck me as quite specific for the right hemisphere. Interestingly, when the, when the, um, the, the left hemisphere is liberated from any control of the right hemisphere, it grasps, or as I use the word, apprehend, which literally means to grapple onto yes. something. Yes. Um, whereas the, whereas the, the right hemisphere's hand, the left hemisphere, the left hand, when it's liberated, explores. It gently explores the space rather than grasping onto something. Now uh, that okay. gentle, dim exploration seems to me exactly what the imagination does and where the riches of imagination lie. And when you said, um, uh, Malcolm, uh, about Eliot and the peripheral vision, uh, and I remember that, uh, I, I, I was thinking how it is the right hemisphere that has peripheral vision. The left hemisphere has a vision of the center of the field only, roughly ah, speaking. Yeah. Um, and, and also, of course, uh, Eliot said this marvelous thing that in the poem, the meaning is the meat that the burglar tosses to the dog while he burgles the house. In other words, the dark stuff goes on while the um, focal mind is captured by this piece of meat, the meaning. <laughs> so um, I think that we, we need to sort of occupy the grasping mind, what I call the apprehending mind. We need to um, uh, uh, give that something to play with and be out of the way while the comprehending mind, the right hemisphere, is able to put together the whole picture. And I prefer comprehension for that because yeah. you can grasp onto something without comprehending it, but comprehension means that you really understand it. And its root is not grappling onto, but pulling together or grasping together. Yeah. And, and, and so that is, um, that's the way I would look at those, those, those phrases. No, I totally get the way you're using there. I mean, I think the way, because of the contrast between imagination apprehending and cool reason comprehending in the Shakespeare, I used... But it doesn't matter, just different terms. I apprehend mean. that gives get hold of. I mean, you know, like monkeys having prehensile yeah. tails. And I was using that as you can get a little bit of it, but not all of it. 
Whereas yes, I yes. Have the ability to bring your mind around it. And what I was yes, yes, I see that. Yes. What we need is a movement from the one to the other. I agree with you. That's I think it. if you have only, only the left brain, as it were, without the right, right brain's comprehensiveness and intuition, then you not only you may get some very precise figures, but you get a false reading of the whole thing. Well, also, yes, I. I demonstrated that the left hemisphere is actually deluded on its own. And I, I mean yeah. that technically. I don't mean that it's just yeah. a little bit off. It actually believes just the sort of thing that people with severe mental illness and brain injuries um, are deceived by. So yeah, it no, is actually I, I ut really utterly, un utterly unreliable on its own yeah. and requires I, I the right hemisphere to help it understand, comprehend the whole picture. I would. I think that's that's a really important thing to know, and it's interesting to know its physiological basis as well. I mean, one of the things I argue in my my other book, Faith, Hope, and Poetry: Theology and the Poetic Imagination, is, and more recently in a book called Lifting the Veil: Imagination, the Kingdom of God, I contend that insofar as there has been a dominance of what you've mapped as left brain thinking since the Enlightenment, that we've constructed as it were, a purely reductive, atomized material view of the world, the kind of thing that Mary Midgley talks about as well uh, in this yeah. sort of atomizing sense. And that we take that for truth, but it is actually a delusion. I mean, the construct yes. of the world yes. as consisting only of quantity and not quality and devoid of meaning is a false construct. Um, oh, absolutely. It's not the case. And the, the, the continuous witness of poets of the imaginative arts of indigenous peoples to another way of seeing the world, which is shows you that we we have a we have a narrow gap so i i i think i mean i think we're living in exciting times i think your work and <laughs> in some ways the work of owen barfield although he's gone now his essays like the coming trauma yeah. of materialism um i think the 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 purely a atomizing uh as it were utterly imminent frame material construct mm. that was taken as a consensus i think it's actually breaking up on every side and yes. people are really we're at a create we're at a kind of crisis moment in in terms of worldview where there's a possibility mm. for really big creative breakthroughs and for somebody yes. some scientists and others to start reimagining in the deepest sense yes. of the world, a picture of the world which is which is more holistic which doesn't yes. include the spiritual of course. I, mean, I think that's a really and, and, and i don't think that's just on the part of you know people like me who believe in a particular faith but i think it's a wider thing people of all mm. faith and none are finally finding if you like the purely empiricist view mm. simply inadequate to reality it's not it doesn't it doesn't as as aristotle would say it's outside type phenomena it doesn't it doesn't save the appearance no. No. Well, they, they, I think everyone has uh, come to feel the bankruptcy, the moral bankruptcy, the intellectual bankruptcy, the spiritual bankruptcy of the idea of reductive materialism. And oddly enough, um, well, the, the, the inanimate sciences, um, physics in particular, got way beyond this 100 years ago, but we've been held back by biologists who've nonetheless stuck with a mid-Victorian hydraulic version of the universe. But I now see that many important figures in the biological sciences can see how this simply won't do any more, and they're moving on in a very exciting way. So I agree with that. What I, what I wouldn't want to do for anything to do would be to um, suggest that I had any brief for those who want to discard either reason or science. They are enormously important uh, handmaidens, yeah. <laughs> but they should always I, be in service to the, the imagination. Yeah. yeah, I think that's exactly what Lewis is saying in that early poem. Reason. Yes. When he yes, says, I think so on the soul's Acropolis, the reason stands. When he says, he who sins against her has defiled his own virginity, no cleansing makes his garment white so clear as reason. I think one of the things he's trying to say is, if two and two actually is four, then you can't yes. end it's five if it would be convenient for you to do so. That we can have no, no truck with my <laughs> truth and uh, or, you know, that awful phrase no. heard during a Trump briefing uh, in the early days of his presidency when they said these are alternative facts. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I think yes. we, I, I mean, I think reason 
has to be put back into an, a place of integration with all our other means of knowing. Yes, ecosynthesis. But I don't think, I think that means that we can we can simply deny things that we know no. to be true because they're inconvenient. Yes, I think academia is academia is at risk of being um, uh, really destroyed by people saying, "Well, my truth is this, and it's just as good as yours." No, there have to be standards for what we accept as truth, Absolutely. and they involve not not being uncritical of science and not realizing that there are things that go beyond reason, because there are things that are beyond both science and reason. But nonetheless, to respect them very mm -hmm. deeply. Uh, Sorry, uh, Roger, you wanted to say something. Uh, I think. Just sort of going back to the. Um, the, the Shakespeare passage where, at the, I mean, the end of his speech, the Theseus talks about, you know, imaginings, how easy in the night, imagining some fear, some fear, how easy is the bush supposed to bear, that actually imagination can indeed, you know, mislead you. But that, but then Hippolyta comes in and says this, that, that talks about the... the, um, the all the story of the night told over. Yes, it grows to some great constancy when, when actually different things come together, that the the um, fantasy's images grows to something of great constancy. And it's actually yes, this- great grows really... is a beautiful word there, because that lovely thing, um, all the, um, uh, uh, he says, all their minds transfigured so together, wit more witnesseth than fancy's images, and grows to something of great constancy, How uh, although howsoever strange and admirable. And I think that grows is really beautiful. What she, I think Hippolyta is saying there is that at first, what the lovers said off stage seemed incredible, but then they they backed each other up. There was more than one witness. There was something transfiguring happening, and that what has happened to them is a process of change and growth which bears its own fruit, and it grows to something of great constancy. And I think, again, because I think all of this is partly Shakespeare looking out at his audience and say, let me show you what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. I'm trying to transfigure all your minds together. And although you know, and I know, and I know that you know that I've made this up at one level, you know, Coleridge would say you've willingly suspended, that willing suspension of disbelief, which for the moment constitutes poetic faith in his beautiful phrase. Nevertheless, I'm going to give you something which grows to constancy, which, which holds water. Mm -hmm. And which therefore is a useful vehicle for you to know yourselves in the world. Yes. And he revisited this at the end of his life in the Tempest with Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think I think a much a much deeper exploration, but then he was an older and wiser man. Oh yeah. Yes, in, in, in my faith open poetry in the second chapter, I basically begin the chapter with a midsummer night's dream and end it with a tempest. Ah, I, right. It's a revisiting of that precisely. Uh, yes, yes. And, um, you know, he recognises the limitations, you know, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, you know, our little life is round with a sleep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a, it's an astonishing exploration of both the use and abuse of, of yes. the cognitive faculties. Um, Prospero is by no means an unambiguous figure. Certainly not. Uh, uh, exactly. But then um, it, it wouldn't be the great work it, it is yeah. if he were not ambiguous, because yeah. ambiguity, I mean, if you like, is at the base of all this. It's the I base of, of, of the poetic art. Um, yeah. Not for nothing did that precocious young man, William Empson, write ah, I was seven about types. To <laughs> Have you seen it argued? I think, I think Jonathan Bate argues this in, his, in one of his books on Shakespeare, talking about Empson's amazing readings of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, he's got a chapter called Quantum Shakespeare. And what he says <laughs> is that Empson, as a brilliant young man, was probably the only person from the English faculty who went to the original lectures of Rutherford and Co. on quantum. And that he knew what was going on. He knew that <laughs> double state, both wave and particle, and not not knowing which it would be and when it, when the wave function would come. That he had learned that, and that that was what gave him license in his literary criticism to notice and value ambiguity, rather than trying to resolve it into one particle of meaning or another particle of meaning, which is what all the previous critics had done. But to stay with the ambiguity and say that's the meaning, this this is coming to you as a way, and it's not yes. to a particle. 
Well, he, he was, uh, I think, a brilliant mind, and uh, as well as a very interesting poet, wasn't he? Um, oh, yeah. Empson. But, uh, I mean, two of his great interests were, in fact, um, physics and uh, Chinese culture. And in both of these, we see the things that sound to us impossible, paradoxical, um, are held to be possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's... Uh, there's um, no, I... I'm very glad you mentioned him because um, I think one of the things I most valued about my own training in literary criticism as an undergraduate in Cambridge, I was fortunate to sit at the feet of Christopher Ricks and others who were, in a sense, disciples of Empson. And um, so that Empsonian um, capacity to hold two things in tension together and not feel yes. that to conquer the other. Yes, yes, no, that's right. Understanding of what poetry is and how it works. Yes. Coleridge had, um, Coleridge was the first person in the West that I know who stated so clearly certain very important ideas. One you've already mentioned, which is that one can distinguish without dividing. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, nowadays, we, we assume that because I've made a distinction, that I mean a division, but I don't. Um, one yeah. can distinguish the north and south pole of a magnet, but they both require one another, and there isn't a hard and fast place where one becomes the other. Yes, so, um, Coleridge attempted uh, to develop what he called polar logic, which I think he yes. also took from some earlier thinkers, but precisely yes. that polarity, that there is a field, there is, as it were, a semantic field of meaning operates yes. between the poles which is what as it were organizes the filings of one you know, one yes um, uh, and you can probably was... remember remember the exact words but i can't but he he says that you know that the the the, the faculty uh, of reason allows us to distinguish um without dividing but then the next stage is to recompose a whole to allow yes, things to go back size, into yes. their union and and this is um, very important in my, my philosophy because I believe that in fact this is the way the hemispheres relate. That the right hemisphere has, if you like, a first grasp of the whole. The left hemisphere then analyzes, breaks up, categorizes, um, spots a theoretical structure. But that is all fine as long as it's then taken back yeah. and up again into a hole in which yeah. that sharpness is is no longer the only truth so it, it's it's resolved resolved into something greater um, but unfortunately in much of our thinking these days we stop at the fragmentation at the analytic stage and say well there we have it but no you're only in the intermediate stage now you need to take that information that you found by this left hemisphere process back into making a new gestalt a new whole vision yes yes i think Col coleridge Coleridge's other distinction between imagination and fancy is very helpful there. Oh, it's so important. You know, and one I often refer to. All the fancy can do is yes. play with what Coleridge call, in the, that passage calls fixities and definites. That's right. Uh, but the, the, the great power of the imagination, the secondary imagination of the poem, is synthesizing. Is yes, yes. Receiving the relations of the parts, you know. And in a passage in Biographia Literaria, where he makes the distinction between imagination and fancy particularly clear, he he um, he makes eight different characteristics on which they can be distinguished from one another, and yeah. every single one of them is a, a way that also the left hemisphere mode of apprehension relates to the right hemisphere mode of comprehension. It's very interesting. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll send. Send I'll you just, just a that. page. Coleridge out would of... be delighted to know that because towards the end of the <laughs> he was trying to to engage with scientists and trying to produce, you know, if I could borrow yes. in advance a phrase of Rupert Sheldrake, a kind of new science of life. He was he was trying yes. to think about nature as a whole, including you know both the imagination and what the imagination apprehends, and he was very interested, therefore, in yes. in the physicality as well as the spirituality of our being and how they so important yeah. yes in a, um, uh, so in advance of his time Coleridge is astonishing really. <laughs> it's kind of 
Yes, no, quite. Mind you, I mean, I don't know how much I, 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 he did actually borrow direct from Schelling, but he did learn from Schelling and other uh, German oh, yes. poets of the same, same era. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I was brought up on the idea that he, he literally stole a hook, line and sinker from Schelling in translation. And I think there are passages in which he does that. Yeah. I mean, he, of course, he, he did translate a lot and he often in his notebook. Yes. Simply wrote down large bits of Schelling. And so there may be a situation in which sometimes he had so in integrated Schelling Fichtelhaus into his own thought that he couldn't he could no longer distinguish no. what he you know. Well I think that's entirely entirely fair, isn't it? Yeah. Um uh, <laughs> and it, it sort of re reminds me of um was it Auden who said um Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> and they, they, they don't do knowingly, but things that they have read somewhere come up in their mind and f yeah. find a new home. They're given yeah. a local habitation and a name. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, I, li I rather like Coleridge's response to those, um, those accusations of plagiarism that came into him later in his life when people, largely as a result of his own efforts, started reading these German philosophers and saying, oh, it's been... Yes, quite. And, and Coleridge is one of Coleridge's responses, brilliant. He said this, he said, truth is the divine ventriloquist. It doesn't matter which of us dummies he speaks through. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, there's something... I, I don't know quite how to put this, but in Coleridge's distinction between fancy and imagination seems to me a very helpful one and um, it's certainly true but it, it's always seemed to me there's something that isn't quite captured in that which he expresses very well in uh, in the ancient mariner actually which is the the way that imagination I mean, it, it's one of the other sort of traps of imagination that it can actually become a kind of poisoned, in, which is what sort of happens in the ancient mariner with the, this sort of horrible vision of uh, of nature. And it it just seems to me that I mean, I, the fantasy you might say that, but it doesn't quite it doesn't quite sort of get to it. I mean, it, what's always there's a wonderful sort of Hebrew word, um, yatsa, which which really just means forming and and sort of making, and it's it's the word that's used to, for, as a potter. Um, uh, you'll mm -hmm. see it, um, but it's also it's it's used um, in the kind of the Genesis mythos. It's the um, it's the word that's used first of all to um, describe um, God making Adam from the ground, and it's it's used um, mm -hmm. again for you know making the soul in man and so on. It's, um, but then when it's applied, it's then in the, in the next chapters it's applied to human beings, and it's it's uh, now they have this this forming capacity that and but then which becomes after the kind of fracture, it's it, the imagination of man is evil from his youth and it's and it goes and so that then you kind of need this sense of the of the redemption of the imagination that somehow our imaginations need to be reformed and that that seems to me what what is happening in in the ancient mariner where you have you have the water snakes of the horrible slimy things and then suddenly they're transformed yeah. It by his vision. Um, yeah. and the vision is under know. moonlight. That's that, that's what causes it. I mean, this is um, that you're right. One of the most tremendous things in that in that poem is the movement from when he's in a state of utter anomie and self disgust and isolation. He sees the water snakes and he says, "A thousand thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I." But then the moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide. And when when he sees them, I mean, in the poem, literally in a new light but obviously in its deepest mm. meaning, metaphorically in a new light. He suddenly says, oh, happy living things, no tongue their mm. beauty might declare. Um, you know, uh, sure, my, uh, oh, well, a spring of love gushed from my heart and I blessed them unaware. So the thing that happens is the renewal of something in the heart. And obviously heart and head language could also map onto the other things. But I always relate that when he when he's in his worst state, and he tries to pray but can't. So he's in a state of utter isolation from what animates and is living around him, but also from God. So in that earlier state, he says, I closed my eyes and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came. 
and made my heart as dry as dust. Now, I think that's a deliberate looking back to the Genesis narrative, and it's an unmaking of his humanity. It's the molded clay, the formed thing being reduced again to dust. <clears throat> and the redemption of vision reverses that. A spring of love gushed, very same word, a spring of love gushed from my heart, and I bless them unaware. He has to be me, he has him to himself to be remade at the deepest mm. level in order to see aright. And yet seeing a right is also what blesses him. You know, uh, the, that that then becomes a circular thing in his, if you like, his holistic vision is is, is re restored. I mean, one of the things I, I say, I mean, perhaps contentiously, I don't know, or controversially in that book, is that not simply that, in a sense, he mapped his own life before it happened. But I think he foresaw an arc as yet unrealized of our cultural history. I think he saw us on the voyage towards that place of utter an anomie in which everything is just, a, you know, a, a, as, as, as he put it in one of his letters, an immense heap of little things, which mm. we then despise. And I think we're just now, and partly through through Ian's work and, and the work of, of others now, beginning to turn and try precisely <laughs> to 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 bring the right brain back in not to not to undo or overwrite the left but to finally make some sense of it in a wider wider sense and i think that's what the mariner does mm. i think i think i mean uh, I, I, he calls the imagination at one point in the biographia literaria the sacred power of self in intuition and he he uses this extraordinarily particular and minute metaphor or analogy drawn from nature. He talks about the chrysalis of the horned fly. And while it's still in this squishy pupa state, it says it creates this chrysalis into which it will grow. Uh, I think Coleridge's exact words are, <coughs> it leaves room in its involucrum for antennae yet to come. And one of the things I think the great works of the artistic imagination can do for us, uh, for us as, as scientists, as much as anything else, is to imagine for us the shape of a vision or a model of the world into which our antennae, our actual, you know, Pacific, particularly perceiving an instrumental way of things, into which it can grow. But it can't grow unless, as it were, the shape has already been sketched, sketched out and the space is held open for it. That's what, that's what a chrysalis does, is it holds open a space into which you grow. That seems to me, I'm not much of a poet, so you could tell me, Malcolm, but that seems to me to accord with my experience of, of trying to write poetry, which is that there is a shape or form that is in your mind, a feeling about the shape of something, and that it only becomes clear as the words start to sort of Absolutely. come into it. Yeah. So it is a creative space, and the, the really key thing is not to try and collapse it into specificity and clarity too early, but to yeah. sit uncomfortably with that um, unknowing, uh, you know, the the the, um, yeah. um, the deliberate unknowing while while the thing comes into being. Absolutely, I think also that the 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 yeah. um, the um, to, to go back to the blessing of the snakes. Uh, and to what Roger was saying about the imagination and that it can sometimes be quite dark in an unpleasant way. I don't think there's there's any anything about the imagination that says it's always got to be um, uh, go to pleasant and uh, mm. um, uh, comfortable places. It takes us to all sorts of places and some of those are perfectly real. And I suppose as a psychiatrist, what I would say is a lot of the things that I found were important, but to get people to accept what Jung called the dark side or the shadow, and, and that this is part of us, and that accepting it is um, healthful, um, healing, and creative. And that's really what I think that passage describes. Yeah, and it's about making a transition from the one to the other. I think one of the most wonderful moments in, um, in Paradise Lost is the opening invocation of light in book three. In Indeed. Which Milton, of course, is blind and he's talking about light. So there's, there's all kinds of poignancy there. But he talks about, he's just written two, the first two books are about hell and in hell. And they're an extraordinary imagination of everything you can think of that you mean by hell and what it might be 
to be the kind of being who says better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But when he comes to the invocation of now he's going to try and describe heaven, he says, he says, he asked the spirit that taught my muse to venture down the dark descent and up to reascend, though hard and rare. So he recognizes that the same muse which took him down now has to bring him up. Mm, mm, he's un he's unapologetic about venturing down the dark descent and up to up uh, and up to reascend. I think he may also be echoing a bit of Virgil there in Aeneas six, where um, of course Aeneas has to descend, and he uh, opens up the question: if if I go down, how do I get up? You know, <laughs> I'm not going down just in order to be down. So going back to the the, the darkened imagination, I. Uh, I think there's a distinction between the artists who need to go down into those dark and terrible places, but in order to bring about a reintegration that's credible, you know, um, like like Karl Barth says about Mozart's music, that we we accept the yes in it because it contains and overcomes a no. But mm -hmm. there are people, for whatever reason, wherever they are in life, who want to venture down the dark descent, but don't want to reascend. And mm -hmm. they don't want you to reascend with them either. So. Uh, I mean, in his younger days, Dylan put his finger on that when he says, uh, one who sings with his tongue on fire, bent out of shape by society's plier, care not, cares not to come up any higher, but rather gets you down to the hole that he's in. Now, uh, you know, it's all right, Mara, if I can't. Yeah. So there, I think we have to distinguish between a whole work, which includes both descent and reascent, and a fragmented work, which, yes. is, if you like, capitulates to despair and doesn't uh, doesn't allow for a completion. To put Bart's uh, observation another way, the only kind of yes that means anything is one that has fully faced the no, yeah, the no knows absolutely. knows what that is, and is able to transcend it. And and the same is true the other way around. So you know the the the, the no uh, needs also to be aware of of the the yes. Yeah. Um, the the negative and the positive are parts of yeah. one another, and can't you can't have one without the other without robbing things of their meaning. Yeah. No. And obviously, it's very hard to make a judgment where people. I mean, I've heard people talk about Beckett and particularly some of the darker the Beckett novels as though they were only. A no. Yes. Uh, I'm not persuaded, actually. I mean, even the very end of The Unnameable, which is extraordinary. I mean, I remember Christopher Ricks once saying to me, the unnameable comes quite close to being the unreadable. And it's true to some degree. But if you do go on, even in the agony of it at the end, you know, the famous last lines, I can't go on, I'll go on. <laughs> you know, unless I finish yes. it, I'll go on. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I mean, you have, um, and in your well, both in your the master and his emissary, and and in in the new book, um, you you talk quite a bit about um, schizophrenia and the the kind of vision of the world that that gives, and the um, you talk about a remarkable book by which I have yet to read, but very much want to by Louis Sass, modernism and and schizophrenia, oh, yes. which seem yes. to have this idea of the. Um, I mean, at the first when I read that, I have to admit I was a bit sort of skeptical because it 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 just seemed, you know, it could be you could use that as a way of sort of beating modernism over the head by saying it's schizophrenic. But that's not, I think, what either he or you are saying at all. But but rather no. the kind of fragmented view of of the world, which seems to um, to be very much a feature of schizophrenia, is also something that is reflected in in quite a lot of modernist literature and painting and and art. Um, and that that it's it's quite hard to know exactly what to make of that really, but it it just it does seem to be very, very clearly the case. Well, you're quite you're quite right that um, there's no suggestion that this is a way of simply rubbishing modern art. Um, great artists will survive whatever the media in which they paint or write is. Um, but nonetheless, they can't avoid reflecting something of the media out of which they arise, even if they do so by rebelling against it, because that will also be part of the culture out of which they, they come. So um, it's hardly surprising that in the 20th century, you see elements uh, in 
in art and in uh, I don't just mean visual art, but Louis, Louis Sass in that book, Madness and Modernism, writes about the whole range of the subtitle is art, art literature, uh, madness in art literature and th insanity in the light of art literature and thought. And, and so he's looking at the whole gamut and finds um, something like 20 to 25 different parallels between phenomena that are recognized in people suffering from schizophrenia and and modern modernist art so it is something absolutely fascinating and it is a book well worth reading it's a very beautifully written book by a man who is a, a very broad range of reference and i think it's um completely compelling and it changed the way in which i was thinking about the hemisphere thing because of course we couldn't be all suddenly developing schizophrenia in the 20th century um what i think it showed was that we were neglecting the aspect of reality that's revealed to us by our right hemispheres and this is very like the, the condition of schizophrenia in which there is a sort of left hemisphere um, hyperactivity or overdrive and um, a, a hypoactivity or, or uh, under under performance under functioning hypo functioning of the right hemisphere so there we are but it's it, you're quite right i mean I, other people have noticed it since i'm very, <laughs> very glad to say so I'm, I'm not alone as it were in in noticing this but um thank you for alerting um everyone to the idea that this is not a way of disparaging modern art as such although it does draw attention to some of the limitations under which for quite a long time it labored yes yes just no, talking about this i i perhaps it's slightly late to throw it into the conversation going back but i just thought because it it seems to be so seminal it might be worth just hearing again the the sentence from coleridge in which he talks about what the imagination does. And he lists, I think you, this may have been one of the ones you had in mind, Ian, where mm -hmm. he felt the things he listed were so close to the way the left and the right work. But this might also yes. be about what an artist does, even in this whole question of modernism. So he says, um, this is what he says uh, about the secondary imagination, differing only in the kind of its own degree from the primary. He says, it goes, it dissolves, diffuses, dissipates, that's if you like one thing, uh, in order to recreate or where this process is rendered impossible, yet still at all events, it struggles to idealize, to unify. It is essentially vital, even as all objects as objects are essentially fixed and dead. Um, so it's, yeah. and it seems to me we're in a transition from precisely the kind of fixed and dead and the dissolving this way. And we're only just beginning to attempt again in our culture to um, to reunify, to recreate. Uh, yes. In, in the notebooks, he writes, um, I was just looking this up now, this power, which is the um, imagination, reveals itself in the balance or reconciliation of opposite or discordant qualities, yes. mm. of sameness with difference, yes. of the general with the concrete, the idea with the image, the individual with the representative, the sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects, a more than usual state of emotion with more than usual order. And I then go on to show how this is a perfect example of the union of what both right and left hemispheres give. Although I ought to point out that the right hemisphere, in any case, um, tends to carry out this unification of what it knows with the left, whereas the left remains defiantly separate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, in a way, it's sort of um, courage is, I mean, biographical literary is, is itself a kind of example of this, and it, it has these dense sort of philosophical passages, but it, it integrates all this with, with his own life and with his... Um, with, um discussions of wordsworth and and oh, the yeah. whole thing is part of a whole life and i i mean ian you were you were talking earlier about your your book against criticism which is i mean i think all three of us were <laughs> sort of studied english literature at a time when when there was a kind of um, <laughs> A rather abstracted kind of view of why you had to, to do this and, and sort of structuralism and, and so on. Um, yes. But, but really, I mean, I mean, Malcolm's study of Coleridge is, is, is very much 
and shows that there is a different way of approaching literature. And I think, um, Absolutely. Do you think there is a, a more constructive way we can actually talk. And we would last time we talked, we were talking about labeling pictures as being such a sort of unpleasant thing as well. Mm. But do you think there is a, I mean, Malcolm has quite an optimistic view that we might actually bring things together. I mean, do you share that at all? Yes, I think that the, the sin of our age is dogma. Dogma in science, dogma in the arts. And when I was studying literature, dogma in literature, mm -hmm. dogma always narrows the mind mm -hmm. and stops one seeing things that are both true at the same time, but according to one part of one's mind can't be, one's got to be one or the other. But actually holding things together in suspension is very important. And I suppose I was lucky enough to be taught by John Bailey, who was completely opposed to any of the current isms of the age. <laughs> um, and and I think that the the, the what, what we may now be seeing is the breakdown of these rather narrow lenses. Because once you apply a certain ism to literature, um, you, you have utterly um, restricted it, and you've replaced it with something of your own um, imagining, which is very much less. So what I'm worried about now is people in universities being forced to subject the great works of literature of the past to a, a colonialist critique or a feminist critique or whatever it is, which will only reveal how superior they are to somebody in the past, won't allow them to contact the riches of what they're seeing. I, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, I think these, these systems, when they become very rigid, you can already predict the result they're going to get. It doesn't matter. Exactly. So yeah, you must. For yeah, that I'm, reason, I, it's not an education; it's an indoctrination. Exactly. So I, there's a wonderful little line, throwaway line. There's a, there's an interesting. I mean, he's, he's died now. Um, Chinese essayist and translator Lin Yu Tang. I mean, he translated a lot of. The oh Chinese. yes. But yes. he wrote one of my favorite books of all time. It's just been a key book for me since I was in my late teens. He wrote a little book called The Importance of Living, which is really a lovely series yes. of familiar essays. But in one of those essays, uh, he's talking about the difference between Chinese and Western thought. But he's at one point he says, every system of thought is a squint at the truth. And the more rigid yes. the system, the worse the squint. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, that's, that's just so right. Um, w w what I love is the, is, is the Chinese insistence on the method of no method, because that's uh, yeah. the only way in which you can allow the thing to live. Your method that you pre-suppose uh, and prejudge things by will um, simply yeah. produce a yeah. Procrustean um, yeah. image with, with the feet and the head chopped off. No, yeah. that's 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 very very true. I mean, oh, you're no, yeah. no system. The great Chinese, you know, phrase Wu Wei is doing nothing. Yes. I, would, yes, I would love to if I could go back in the past and have a <laughs> conversation with somebody. One of the things I would do is I'd try to have a conversation with Keats because Keats' account in his letter of what he calls negative capability, yeah, which is famously, this yeah. awareness of everything, but a refusal to impose yourself on them, which he thought exactly. Shakespeare had supremely, and he tried to cultivate right. himself. That seems to me very close to Wu Wei, you know. To... <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Interesting, to... when I was writing against criticism, um, I, I was sitting uh, at lunch one day with David Hawkes, who was a very great sinologist, and I was trying to explain to him that the things I wanted to say in my book against criticism didn't seem to be easy to articulate in English. Why is the implicit so much more important than the explicit? Why is the whole not achieved by the summing the parts? Why is the unique something that language completely refuses to be able to um, respect? And he said, in Chinese, there are terms for all of this. And at that stage, I had to decide whether to become a sinologist or a doctor. And I'm afraid I became a medical doctor. <laughs> well, we're Fortunately, glad there's some great sinologists out there, so we can... Yeah. Yeah. I had this experience yes. a couple of... Um, the other year, I was, I was going to an exhibition of students' work um, 
And um, it was actually some, some, some lovely work, but students now in art schools are sort of told to explain their work. They have to stand in front of it and give you some explanations. Yeah. And there's one, he's actually oh. a Chinese, uh, a wonderful um, kind of, uh, and he'd, he'd mastered all the, the glorious sort of techniques of Chinese sort of painting and used them um, bringing in, with the Western ways of seeing as well. And he'd, he'd done this really lovely picture and he was, um, he was standing in front of it and I was looking at the picture and he was doing what he was being told to do. And he was giving me this absolutely sort of banal sort of art speak <laughs> explanation of the thing. Well, it's behind him, the, the picture <laughs> being its heart out. And I just, just wanted to tell him to, to be quiet and let the picture sing. But yeah. it's... it's a... <laughs> the work of art is its own best expression. And this business of trying to uh, reduce it all to a statement, if it had been reducible to a statement, there'd be no point in creating the work of art in the first yeah. place. Oh, I absolutely, my experience in trying to write poetry is very much that if if I know before I write the poem what it's going to be, what's in it, and that turns out to be the case, <laughs> then it is not a poem, it's a note to self. And basically... Yes. What I'm waiting for when I write is like the quickening kick in the, of the babe in the womb or the pulse of the fish. Yep. Coming out of the I want something that resists what I was about to do to it and says, no, yes. I'll write it like this. Then I know yes. I've got something. And I'm paradoxically, I know I've got something when I don't know what it is. And I haven't got something that's... when I do know what it is. Yes. No, that's very, very lovely. It's very good. And it's like Pushkin's remark at the end of Yevgeny and Egin that, you know, at the outset, he had no idea where this path was going to lead. And I really believe he didn't. And yet the whole thing came into being. It's slightly like in reference to Wu Wei, you know, the sage does nothing, but nothing is left undone. So that yeah. by the not knowing and the not doing, the thing is allowed to come into being. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's what I call act, active passivity, a sort of renunciation or, Malcolm, kenosis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. This, this yeah. might be rather a good time to actually have a, a poem. Um, uh, and I don't know, if Malcolm, if you might um, um, read us that your wonderful villanelle on... Um, <laughs> On, on the yes, um, yes. Um, this is a, yeah, this is. I was going to say this is a, a true story in the sense that I was supposed to be giving a talk on poetry, illustrated by some of my poems, and I had not got the hand, handouts adequately done, you know. And I thought I only had five <laughs> minutes before the lecture. I thought there'll be a photocopying room, and there'll be a photocopier. And of course, in my young day, a photocopier was a really simple thing where you just put something <laughs> on the top, and there was one button on it which helpfully said copy. <laughs> And I went into this room, there's this huge machine, you couldn't even tell which was the front or the back, all these trays out. So I said to a friend, which is more like a Hindu god than a photocopier. But anyway, there was nobody to help me. And I, put, and I started a thing off, and of course it jammed completely. And started saying jam in a tray A, you know, open door B, you know, I couldn't do it. So I pulled these inadequate man mangled what I'd got and had the bell went, I had to go off and give a lecture. And I came back and it was literally the case, there's a woman standing there looking outraged and holding one of my crumpled poems in her hands. And she pointed a <laughs> finger at me and said, your poetry is jamming my machine. And obviously I thought, that's a fantastic line. But I, I didn't say that, of course, you know, so I was very apologetic. <laughs> He pulled the rest of my poetry out of this machine and I was very apologetic. But I noticed as I was leaving that she was uncrumpling one of the papers and reading the poem. So I thought I thought I should write that <laughs> poem. I chose the Villanelle partly because, because it works with this beautiful pattern of repeated lines. It is in one sense a, a poem that photocopies itself. I mean, it kind of goes down like that. But anyway, it came out like this. It's a snappily titled On Being Told My Poetry Is Found in a Broken Photocopier. My poetry is jamming your machine. It broke the photocopier. I'm to blame with pictures copied from a world unseen. My poem is in the works. I'm on the scene. We free my verse and I confess my shame. My poetry is jamming your machine. Though you berate me with what might have been, you stop to read the poem just the same. And pictures copied from a world unseen subvert the icons on your mental screen and open windows with a whispered name. My poetry is jamming your machine for chosen words can change the things they mean and set the once familiar world aflame with pictures copied from a world unseen. The mental props give way on which you lean. The world you see will never be the same. 
saying, my poetry is jamming your machine with pictures copied from a world unseen. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you both very much. This has been a wonderful conversation, and um, perhaps we'll do it again sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was delighted. And I'm so pleased to meet you. Here, lovely. Even if only on this uh, one, it's very nice. Uh, and you're I'll welcome to. Great pleasure. Way. Yes, I hope so. Yes. I, I will have to come to Cambridge at some point. So <laughs> well, I'm now in Norfolk, but I do come back down to Cambridge. Oh, you're in Norfolk. Oh, OK. All right, then. <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm all, I'd be more than happy to come to Cambridge and meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. OK. Bye.